Hallelujah. Welcome to Altar. That is the A-Life Truth Academy resources. We are looking at the last two subjects of the course L3, which is Loyal Lead Leaders. The 19th subject is Hermeneutics. And the 20th subject is Homiletics. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we truly want to thank you for your love and goodness in our lives. As we continue on this Jesus journey, learning as your disciples, we pray, Father God, that you would quicken your word to our spirits by your Holy Spirit, that we would glorify your name as we learn to interpret scripture rightly in context. And we pray that you would cause us also to learn how to deliver the messages that we preach. We thank you, Father, for your presence with us. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' mighty name. Let's blow the shofar. Amen. We now look at uh, subject 19 from the course of Loyal Lead Leaders, the L3 course, and our subject is hermeneutics. Let's read from Timothy, that's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for four things. Firstly, teaching. Secondly, rebuking. Thirdly, correcting. And fourthly, training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Isn't that power pack? Those two verses. It gives you purpose for scripture. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul's words about the usefulness of scripture are absolutely true. And everyone who calls themselves a Christian should strive to know the truth on a personal level. We must be growing in intimacy with God. The Word of God, Scripture, is our very bread of life for our inner man, for our spiritual man. We must learn how to interpret the Bible. Now, what's the meaning of hermeneutics? Biblical hermeneutics is the branch of knowledge that deals with interpretation, explaining in what context that particular text or verse is. Amen. How to interpret the Holy Bible or other text in literature. Hermeneutics is not to be misunderstood or confused with exegesis, where exegesis refers to the interpretation of a specific biblical text. Hermeneutics is deciding which principles we will use in order to interpret the text. Now, what are the different types of biblical hermeneutics? There are four main types of biblical hermeneutics. And when you see all through history, all the four types were used. Although now we use a particular interpretation, and that's the first one. The first one is literal interpretation. This approach is seeking to have a plain meaning of the biblical text. This is not only to imply that every passage of scripture should be interpreted literally, but rather the plain meaning be accepted as truth. So it's not complicated. Amen. Now, for instance, when Jesus said the Christians are the light of the world, we don't believe we are literally a hundred watt bulb lit up. We do believe that Jesus was telling us plainly that it is our role to showcase the love of God to everyone around us. Remember, the word of God is a masterpiece work of literature, which contains poetry and prose. And there are many figures of speech. And I think for better understanding, we need to interpret it rightly. Besides literal interpretation, there is also moral 
interpretation originally practiced by the Jews who believed their laws, their poems, and historical narratives had multiple layers of meanings. This approach supposes to reveal the ethics behind any text. One popular example is the Epistle of Barnabas. According to us, it's an apocryphal book where the author believes the Old Testament food laws are misunderstood by the people of Israel. Rather than restricting diet, he believes the laws were meant to avoid behavior which was associated with these particular animals. The third interpretation is the allegorical interpretation. These are allegories closely associated with moral interpretation. This type of hermeneutics viewed the biblical narratives as having a secondary level of meaning. Most often, this meant interpreting people and events as only foreshadowing people and events in the New Testament. Usually, Jesus and his actions. One such case would be Noah. Rather than focusing on whether or not a worldwide flood actually happened, viewing the story as an allegory allowed the readers to conclude what type of a person God was seeking as followers. Well, the fourth one is anagogical interpretation, defined as mystical or spiritual. This approach sought to interpret scripture in view of the life to come about the future, relying significantly on numerical values of Hebrew letters and words. The Hebrew language is very much pictorial, but also numerical in nature. The focus here was on messianic prophecies and the study of the last days. Similar to moral and allegorical, interpretation, importance was not given to the actual story, but to a perceived deeper meaning behind the story. So to repeat, the four types of biblical hermeneutics or four types of interpretation of scripture are number one, literal interpretation, number two, moral interpretation, thirdly, allegorical interpretation, and fourthly, anagogical interpretation. Now, what are the different rules of hermeneutics? There are multiple approaches and disagreements about which branch of hermeneutics should be utilized, and we haven't yet interpreted a single verse from the Bible. Unfortunately, it's true that people can find anything to argue about. All of this may have you asking the question, how do I integrate biblical hermeneutics? While there are various branches of hermeneutics, we will be discussing the literal interpretation branch. That's where the evangelicals are consistent with of today's day. We believe this allows us to understand both the original intent of the authors as well as discover how it applies to us. Very important, literally what the story means. And secondly, how it applies to us for today in our context, in our lives. Here are four great rules for your personal study. Number one, define the terms. When you are first attempting to understand the Bible, knowing the definitions of the words used by the authors, this is the, a great first step. But you should also know if you are reading historical, narrative, poetry, or a parable. Each literary style comes with its own rules of interpretation, undoubtedly understood by the authors who pen them. For example, prose or poetry, figures of speech. Number two, context is king. Hallelujah. We must 
know the context of the text. Remember, a text out of context is a pretext. Laughing at a joke is appropriate. There's humor. Amen. Laughing is not a sin. But laughing at a joke during a funeral service may not be as appropriate. Knowing the context is key to being able to interpret anything, including the stories from the Bible. Understanding how Jesus' words would have been interpreted by his original audience. Amen. This is an important step to being able to properly apply the truth in our own lives. Glory be to God. Number three, look to Jesus. Do we mean to suggest that every story, poem, or verse only has significance as we consider the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? To be perfectly succinct, yes, the life and work of Jesus is the very center of all historical truth. In fact, the Holy Bible is the Word of God, and the Word of God is Jesus. Because in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Right from cover to cover, or from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ, Adonai Yehoshua. HaMashiach. Amen. So, we need to look to Jesus. He is the center of all historical truth. He's the perfect man, the only perfect man in the human race. Hallelujah. Adam and Eve were made perfect, but they lost it when they fell into temptation. And we see the deception of Eve and the disobedience of Adam brought sin into their lives, into the whole human race, and it affected the whole environment, the whole of planet Earth. The Old Testament prophesies the coming of Jesus, and the New Testament teaches us about the extent of what Jesus did. Every story, every verse, every detail involves real people, reeling narrative, and truth about God. Number four, start with prayer. Start with prayer and end with prayer. Prayer is the very breathing of any Christian. When we pray, we reveal ourselves to be dependent on God and to get connected with Him through His Holy Word. When we pray, we talk to Him. When we read God's Word or hear His Word, He talks to us through His Word. We must make sure that prayer permeates every step along the way in our interpretation of the Bible. Since God will be most concerned with our application of the Bible, it follows God would be most interested in ensuring we utilize biblical hermeneutics correctly. Hallelujah. So, once again, there are four great rules Number one, define the term. Definitions are so very important to understand the meaning of words and the whole concept. Secondly, context is king. That's the central part of our text. And thirdly, look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The word brings faith. And so when we make an attempt to interpret God's word, it must bring faith. It's the Logos word becoming the rhema word, the written word becoming the spoken word quickened by the Holy Spirit himself. Hallelujah. And fourthly, we need to be dependent on God. And so we begin with prayer. We continue in prayer as we mull upon God's word and study God's word to show ourselves not approved unto men, but unto God and continue praying. When we are spirit filled and we pray in tongues, we get so connected 
by praying in the Spirit that we build up our most holy faith according to Jude 20. And I believe when we are studying God's Word and we attempt to bring the right interpretation or we study the Word with applying hermeneutics and the principles of it, we must remember as we pray in tongues, God will download from heaven into our hearts the interpretation. God is so good. He will equip us. He will help us. After all, the Holy Spirit, the Parakletos, is come here to fill us with his presence, to fill us with his power. He's the best teacher. The anointing within us is what will teach us. He's the one who will teach us. He's the one who comes alongside of us. He not only gives us an assistance, he gives us the ability to understand scripture in the right context. So praise God for hermeneutics. Every student of the word of God, every believer in Christ, every born again Christian must apply hermeneutics in his or study of God's word so that he would present it rightly, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. To all serious students of God's word. Remember Apostle Paul, when he would preach, the Berean Christians would steadfastly and diligently search the scriptures to see even Apostle Paul such a spiritual giant to check whether he is in line with scripture in his interpretation and in his content. Hallelujah. So, people of God, student of God's word, disciple of Jesus Christ, let's dive into the study of God's word so that we would apply the principles of hermeneutics so that we would be better teachers of the word of God shall we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your love and goodness in our lives. We pray that we would make your word plain and clear as our minds are plain and clear to receive your word in that same clarity and simplicity and yet being profound. We can present your word to others to assimilate it and to digest your word to build up faith and to enlighten and envision and empower your people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And God's people shout, Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We move into subject 20 of the L3 Coast. That's the loyal lead leaders. And we are talking about the subject called homiletics. Remember the word homilies? We are delivering a message or sermons. Well, the art of preaching is homiletics. Now, preaching is actually the final product of a lot of time spent and invested into the thinking, praying, researching, and strategizing by the speaker. Hallelujah. Having spent much time in secret with the master dependent on the Holy Spirit and possibly drafted the sermon. The preacher eventually delivers within a far shorter time compared to the time they spent in gathering and organizing materials. Most of us enjoy good and well presented messages or sermons, especially if they meet our spiritual dietary needs. When we explore God's word, it is important to know that this preparation time is so very important. Amen. Hallelujah. We begin to take on resources that would help us or aid us in our quest so that we would have substance and we would have the art of preaching when we deliver the goods. Now, the first things first, we must be prudent and we must be diligent to delve in details of a text or context and even passage or theme that we are going to preach on. 
What's the definition of homiletics? Homiletics has to do with the whole process of preparing and delivering a message. For our purpose, a sermon maybe. In fact, nowadays, we shouldn't be sermonizing. The days of sermonizing is over, I guess, because it tends to become a ritual. It tends to become some routine and you are fulfilling your duty as a preacher or minister. I believe every time a preacher preaches or a teacher teaches, we need to have a message which is a prophetic word. Hallelujah. That is very apt and applicable for our times today. Amen. So this involves collecting, analyzing, sifting, and orderly organizing the materials for presentation to a given audience in a particular time frame. Nearly all preachers undertake some form of hind preparation before they can speak, unless exceptional t times and circumstances dictate an impromptu speech or giving an impromptu message ex contemporary. In ordinary circumstances, they may write the full text or just jot down main points, often arranged in a preferred order and organization. More than that, the preacher must use appropriately accurate words. His tone must be right and posture as well as they deliver the message, aiming at evoking a particular desired response. If you are preaching the gospel for salvation, then there must be a challenge at the end to receive the Lord so that we would have some definite commitment to Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. At the end of a message, there needs to be an application. Application is so very important. It's not only the diagnosis of a message, but you must deliver the remedies for the diagnosis done so that people are not left high and dry. They must not only see their problems, but those problems must be addressed with solution. Hallelujah. Amen. The preacher often aims to communicate one or two points to their audience and will ensure they succeed in doing so. George Whitefield, a man of God, a servant of God, once remarked that the preacher's aim is to make their audience turn words into pictures. Hallelujah. It's so nice to turn words into pictures. It should be very picturesque. Years must be turned into eyes, as it were. Another has stated that he is the best preacher that can make children grasp their sermon in totality. For example, people who volunteer themselves to teach children in Sunday school, in the children's church class. It is a wonderful experience and a wonderful preparation for becoming a teacher of the word for adults or a preacher towards everyone. Because if you can make children understand with the simplicity and clarity of the word of God, then you have succeeded in helping the others and the adults to receive God's word in all totality. Praise be to God. In preaching, one must captivate the hearts of the listener. It takes off well and it continues steadfastly progressing into the climax and it ends with a punch. Hallelujah. Very, very important. In short, we may state that homiletics is more than just mere preparation, but also how effectively this message is communicated across to whoever is in the path of the message. Hallelujah. Personally, I would describe homiletics as four P's, an alliteration. First, learn preparation. Secondly, presentation. Thirdly, penetration, and fourthly, produce fruit. When God's word goes forth, it will never return void. It will accomplish 
the purpose it has been sent out for. Amen. It will bring forth fruit. The sermon preparation or the message preparation has a process. The preacher must be in the correct frame of mind. Just like when you're at the desk and your desk is all cluttered with different things. I think that's not the best way you can start writing if you're a writer or even if you want to study. It's good to just clear the desk and uh, it reflects of a clarity of mind. If you have everything cluttered on the table, you would also most probably have all clutter in your mind. You need clarity of mind and that will give you clarity of understanding. And the clarity of understanding will give you clarity of speech. And when you have clarity of speech, certainly the audience will have clarity of hearing and listening. And they would certainly be attentive and digest what they are hearing. And they will build up faith and they will learn principles to be applied. And it will bring a renewal of mind and a transformation of life. Hallelujah. A preacher must sharpen his mind or her mind. Tune the heart. Read up and let what they digest simmer in their system before they proceed to write or speak. Charles Bridges, 1997, adds the habit of meditation to the sermon preparation process. In addition to special prayer, as a person composes a sermon, the text must be clear as ideas, thoughts, concepts, suggestion and appropriate nuggets come to crystallize in the mind while the presenter gears up for preaching. I would suggest one would pray in tongues. After studying the word, drawing data, pray in tongues. And whilst praying in tongues, you are building up your most holy faith. Jude 20. And that faith that you build up and present to God will be pleasing to Him. When you pray in tongues, God word, when you speak in tongues, what will happen? God will download into your heart from heaven an interpretation of what you have been speaking. By God's grace, we would download the rhema word of God. Amen. And that would be so fresh from, the, from heaven's oven. Amen. Spurgeon would say that if we are to preach, we must position our minds to effectively preach doctrinally, and potently by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our helper, our enabler. He's the parakletos. He comes alongside of us to help us. We carry an important message from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, both in speaking to his students and addressing his ministers. Spurgeon made much of the inner quality of the preacher, knowing that they spoke on behalf of the master. A preacher is a spokesperson of the Lord himself. In order to prepare the message, several strands must come together to enhance effective preparation, like a beautiful tapestry. Among these would include, I would present to you almost eight strands that we can look at. Number one, know the topic or theme you intend to speak. This is very critical. Be mindful of spiritual needs. Be wanting and willing to satisfy the spiritual needs of the people, of the hearers, that they would be fed with the pure milk of God's word. They would be fed with morsels of nutritious food spiritually. Hallelujah. Amen. C.H. Spurgeon at times would wrestle and struggle finding a text, at times finding one just a few hours before pulpit time, almost going into impromptu, spontaneous delivery. It could happen that way, and very often it has happened, even to me. But that doesn't mean you haven't to prepare. God is very merciful and gracious. Hallelujah. 
just like a building which has a foundation and the structure and the erection of the building is dependent on the foundation. The foundation cannot be seen. So in your private time, you prepare the message from God's word and take help from even other aids like Bible commentaries and uh, maybe a handbook, Bible dictionary, maybe a lexicon, a Strong's Concordance, different versions, whatever you take on. Make sure you don't run to those aids before diving into God's Word. God's Word and the text that you are choosing is the centrifugal force. It is the focus of your message. So after going through it and mulling over it, we would go to other aids so that we would get an enriching recipe and nourishing food that is going to be presented to the people. So first is know the topic or team you intend to speak to. Hallelujah. You must get into data mining. Hallelujah. We must both socially and spiritually be intelligent. Hallelujah. This demands much work. Amen. I think every preacher and teacher must be aware of what's going around so you cannot be like an ostrich that buries its head in the hole and says there's no storm out there. So we must listen to news. We must read the newspapers and be aware of what's happening. Don't dive in it for hours, but just at least go through the headlines and see what's happening. Amen. Be aware of your, of your surrounding. Be aware of what's happening in your city, in your, in your country, in the world. And you would be able to deliver the goods better to help people in difficult time. The word of God has helped all kinds of people over the millennium and over the years, these past 6,000 years. Amen. God has spoken and built up and encouraged kings and lawyers and doctors and fishermen and shepherds and the intellectuals and the not so intellectuals. Amen. The rich, the poor, people in bondage, people who are free, man, woman, and child, all kinds. Hallelujah. Number two, the Bible must be the center of all that we read or intend to talk about. Amen. You may use all the aids, the commentaries, the lexicon, the concordances, whatever. That would help exegete and interpret the text better, give you a better understanding. So you would bring that understanding to others. It is important to make a sermon outline or structure before going to the tools for help. Because you know where you are taking your people on the journey of the message. So it's like going into a cottage or a bungalow or a flat. You enter into the hall and uh, then you move and look at maybe the kitchen and you look at the bedrooms and it's all done systematically. And after the whole view, you come out once again through the entrance, which is now the exit. So think about you taking off in an aircraft. And when you take off, there's a smooth takeoff and you're happy about it. And you're rising up and going to the clouds and you're enjoying flying in the midst of the clouds and above the clouds. You're enjoying your flying. But what's the point in just staying there and going around and round and round or even just staying up there and not knowing how to land safely and smoothly? So also when we preach, we sometimes lose track of time, which is fine if there is time. But if it's a conference and you have other speakers, you need to have integrity and uh, speak within the time frame you are given and not eat into other people's time, right? Also, when you preach and teach, don't say this is the last point and go on to 
six more points. If that happens, then you need to apologize and say, give them the clarity when you are going to stop. Sometimes it may be an abrupt stop, but that should be the climax of your message so that you would have the nail hammered on the head and driven into the wood. Amen. Number three, having wrestled with the text, continue thinking through, meditating, just mulling over it, chewing the spiritual cud, amen, of the word, like a cow with its ruminating of the grass that it is eating and going on chewing it. To facilitate this, I would recommend putting your sermon outline aside to allow the text to simmer. Amen. I believe all our messages should be like sizzlers. Shh. Hallelujah. Amen. It must be burning on the inside of you. If you are not convinced that your message has a good content or substance, then you better don't preach that message until you come to a point where you know you are imparting something very precious, something that God wants you to tell your audience or the church or the people. Amen. As you meditate, the Hebrew word in Joshua 1.8 is to medicate yourself. When you meditate on his word day and night, you medicate yourself and you inject yourself with the word of God. It becomes flesh and blood in your life and uh, you will have good success and you will make your way prosperous. Hallelujah. The key in growing in God's word is meditation. You know, the Psalms, in the book of Psalms, you see the word sila, and sila simply means meditate on the previous verse because they have something very important to draw to your attention. It's not just running on a, on running on a fast horse, but it is taking time to digest what you are consuming. Number four, revisit your sermon or your message a day or so later to see if any of your thoughts or ideas have changed. Fine tune your sermon, its structure, points, illustrations. You could use alliteration, the same alphabet across, or maybe an A, B, C, D, giving points as numbers. And um, it's very helpful for the listener to remember. Hallelujah. Number five, again, read widely on the subject matter at hand. Amen. Read from a collection of other sound writers, academic and devotional writings. Praise the Lord. Look at commentaries, other helps, countercheck, compare notes. Hallelujah. All these things are very much in line with preparation. Number six, we would recommend some time between your preaching and preparation because if you rise from your study straight to the pulpit, chances are that the materials have not nicely integrated into your system. It could be haphazard or the line of thoughts are not arranged well and according to progression. Therefore, it is important to assimilate your points, think it over. There could be changes here and there, but look for the maximum, optimum effect of the message being delivered. Amen. Seventhly, pray much before, during, and after the preparation so that God would confirm the truth upon your heart. I would challenge you to tell your intercessors, keep a few intercessors close to you. And whenever you go on an assignment of preaching or teaching, it may be in the church and you have to trust some people to pray for you, those who are faithful intercessors. And this will be such a help and boost to your preaching and teaching. Amen. Improvise. Amen. Hallelujah. So have an impressive takeoff and an impressive landing. Amen. Deliver the goods. Amen. No matter where you take the people in your message, you must drive home. Hallelujah. You must shoot gold. 
you must fulfill the purpose of your message. Amen. And number eight, head out to deliver in the name of Jesus. Praise be to God. So we've seen the process towards sermon preparation. Now let's look at the three sections that a basic sermon or message has. What are the three sections? Number one, the introduction. The sermon preparer must organize the introduction so that it is catchy, interesting, and can easily resonate with the target audience. It must be captivating. If you lose your listener in the first two minutes, then you have lost them for the whole message. Some start with stories while others delve straight into the subject matter, having given an overview. Whichever approach utilized, the introduction must be interesting and give a bird's eye view of what is in store so that the people know where the journey is going to start and where it's going to end. Amen. The second part is the main body. This is where the subject matter lies and here the sermon or the message must have as much meat or substance as it can so that we can get all the audience, uh, we can deliver the goods to the whole audience. Amen. Make sure they receive it. Hallelujah. This main body may be divided into a few points, sometimes with rhymes, sometimes with alliterations, sometimes with a progression and some vivid words used so you know you're making progress with the body, not an unending kind of moving in circle type. We must get this very clear. Amen. And thirdly, there must be a conclusion and an application. Hallelujah. Whatever begins well must end well. Amen. And it's always that mercy triumphs over judgment. No matter what your diagnosis have been, you must give the remedies to the problems. Amen. In this way, it would be very much meaningful, constructive, helpful to your listener, and they would never be the same again. We trust that every message must help the listener of the how-tos. Amen. There are various types of sermon. Um, there are three well-known ones, and the first one is textual. This is a sermon that takes a passage, probably a chapter or striking subject head and expounds the central truth, commenting on selected verses within the wider context. A preacher who takes this approach must have a wide knowledge of the Bible and be able to winsomely collate all the scriptures to bear on that passage. See, it's Spurgeon, one of the best preachers, that is why we're using his name, was a champion of this style, a textual message. Secondly, an expository. An expository preaching takes many forms, but one of the finest and best known styles is the verse by verse expository preaching. Amen. Like an exegesis. This approach is usually a consecutive type of sermon preaching in a given book, say a doctrinal one from the first verse right through the end of the book. Hallelujah. To do an excellent exegesis or being an expositor demands a good vocabulary and tesserus as well. Praise God. The third one is topical preaching. Topical sermons draw all the related verses from right across scriptures into one concentrated treatment of the subject. It is usually independent of any given text, though alludes to the sense and meaning of several passages. Different senses across scripture. Hallelujah. Remember, when you preach, tell the people, take them into confidence, educate them, and... Uh, Speak the truth in love. Also, when you take on an example, an illustration, remember to quote the author 
or a book that you've taken the example from. Now, sometimes you may not even remember the author's name or really to you it's anonymous. Uh, well, be honest about it and say, one preacher says like this, but don't try to say, you said it, because that would be plagiarism, right? And uh, before God, there's no integrity. We must have morals, ethics, integrity in our preaching. Do not underestimate your congregation. Do not underestimate your audience. Very many preachers would think that their audience is not good enough to understand something, maybe a particular topic or some fact or truth. And uh, the preacher may be tempted to just um, let go of something which is not factual. That is absolutely wrong. One can say, I think it's this. I'm open to correction, but this is my gut feeling. This is what I feel, what I think, what I see. I think that would be very helpful. And the audience knows that you are honest about the content that you are delivering or the substance. They will begin to appreciate you more and they would be wanting to hear you more. Amen. Remember, before preaching, get right with God. Amen. Maybe along the way, you've had some disturbance with someone in the traffic, and uh, you've just grumbled within yourself, or been getting out of the house, by you've maybe kicked the dog or the cat, or, or you've argued with someone in the family. Get right. Get right. Have a clean slate before the Lord. Amen. He's faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to confess these things, come in agreement with them, clear it up, and let the downlord from heaven flow through our hearts, through our mouths, into the ears of the listeners and into the hearts of the listeners, that they would be challenged not only to be a hearer of God's word, but a doer as well. Hallelujah. Some lessons that we can take home in our homiletics. Number one, homiletics is a hard but necessary work. Amen. It's not only preparation, it's also the de delivery of the message. Hallelujah. Number two, it has to do with sermon preparation and delivery. Thirdly, so many dynamics take place when a person is to preach both before, during, and after. Fourthly, preaching is serious business and must be taken seriously. Number five, the mode of delivery may differ depending on the target group and context. You must be flexible about that. Amen. God would sometimes just prompt you to change your whole message. The other day we had a meeting and the pastor said, Hey, my bag got lost and I had all my notes and all that I studied for today's message. Well, he had to just trust God and deliver the goods. Sometimes that could happen. Number five, the mode of delivery may differ depending on the target group and context. Number six, the content should be as biblical as possible. Avoid old wives' fables and superstitions and all these kind of things. Okay, myths give flesh and blood examples. Give your personal experience. Amen. But don't get opinionated. Okay, when you counsel someone, it's not the advice, it's not the opinion that you give, which is true counseling. Counseling comes from the Word of God, the counsel of God's Word which is the truth. Amen. And the truth, knowing the truth, it would set people free. Number seven, before a sermon is prepared, the text and theme must be very clear. Number eight, sermon structure has three parts. What we did, there should be an introduction, the main body, and then the conclusion with application. Number nine, application is necessary for the conclusion. The preacher applies the truths 
to the present day hearers. The message must come to bear on the hearts and minds of the hearers. Number 10, to be a great exegete and interpreter of scripture. It is encouraged to know at least one of the original languages, although it's not mandatory. If you know the meaning, the original text, sometimes it would be helpful. This you could get even with the aids that are available. It's not necessary that you know the language of Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek, but equip yourself with uh, better learning. Amen. And take helps from the various study aids. Number 11. Helps outside the scriptures must be consulted after an individual has first wrestled with his text. Amen. Number 12. Sermon preparation must begin early to avoid panic and half-baked sermons. If you do not prepare, then you plan to fail. When you prepare, you plan to succeed. Number 13. The preacher must know which type of sermon or message they wish to deliver, whether topical, expository, or textual, evangelistic, doctrinal, etc. This will help with clarity to the listener. What's the conclusion? Sermon preparation is hard work, demanding serious attention of the preacher. The sermon preparer does well to start early as well as read widely so as to be competent people who rightly divide the word of truth. 1 Timothy 2.15 May God grant excellent preachers in the midst of the years. Amen. More than reading books, let's read the book of books. Hallelujah, the Holy Bible. But I want to challenge all the preachers to read as many books as possible. Reference books, books that you can learn from. You go through different books in a quick manner and glean wonderful gems from them. Hallelujah. And spend more time mulling over, meditating, studying, maybe memorizing. And this will enrich your spirit. You will hide God's word that you would not sin against. Hallelujah. Let your heart be the storehouse of God's word. And out of the abundance of the heart, let your mouth speak forth the oracles of God, the prophetic word of God, the life-giving word of God, the words of life from your tongue. Hallelujah. And you will eat the fruit thereof and give others to eat the fruit thereof. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for these two wonderful topics, hermeneutics, the interpretation of Holy Scripture, and homiletics, the preparation and the presentation and the penetration of the message you give your servants to deliver to your people in edification to the believers and in evangelism to the world at large. Lord, we pray you would raise up every believer to be a preacher and a teacher of God's word with signs, wonders, and miracles following. Because your great commission, the commission of the Lord Jesus Christ, entails every believer to preach and teach and to exercise the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So be it in this last day and the last hour of this last day, that the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ would arise with every member preaching and teaching your holy word. The preachers and teachers would always be filled with the Holy Spirit and the leadership in the body of Christ would not suppress or quench the spirit by stifling women, but all would preach men, women, and children in their own context. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.